PhD doing in the cannabis industry? Well, there's actually a lot more of us than you'd think. Um, my journey was kind of an accidental one on purpose. Um, I'd actually left chemistry for a bit, and uh, I, was, I was an MRI tech. You make a lot more money as an MRI tech than you do as an adjunct lecturer, but, but I always miss chemistry. I was always committed to medicine, and I really, really, really like the smell of weed. Really, really, really. I think I have some on, oh yeah, a little aromatherapy on my fingers there. And so uh, I decided to take a plunge and just go out there. And uh, Nate Ferguson over there gave me a chance. He said, you know, we're going to bring this guy on board and uh, see what he can do. So it's been an adventure since then. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with the talk. You got the slides? OK. Looks like I have the slides. Here we go. Okay, so um, until very recently, most of you, if you knew about me, knew me as Dr. Jack Hughes, a little bitty Instagram page. And uh, because of my, med my medical connection, I could not reveal my real name. Even though Kaiser will uh, actually prescribe cannabis to dying patients, they won't let MRI techs who use cannabis be employed there. So, you know, that's what that is. My name's Wyeth Calloway. Like I said, we're going to talk about the, uh, a study in the uh, expansion of production through technical improvements and innovations. So Jetty's changed a lot since I first walked in the door. And it's not just been me. It's been a team. I just want to emphasize that entire time. I've been kind of like, let's, let's, let's make the nerd analogy to the Starship Enterprise. I'm pretty much like Spock, OK? So <laughs> I would you know, say things like, this isn't a logical course. I am 100% certain this will fail. <laughs> Things like that. So um, let's, let's move forward. And where's my clicker? There we go. So there we are. So here's Jetty. This is some uh, pictures of Jetty, who we are. And uh, right up there is our nice reception room. Here is my messy R&D corner. And uh, this is actually a uh, column for column chromatography. You know, I, I like to run kilo scale. And uh, over here is what used to be the rotovap area. So we'll talk more about that. And last but not least is the bee who greeted me on my first day at Jetty when I didn't even know what honey oil meant. <laughs> so it was very ironic. OK? I knew what bubble hash was. I've been making bubble hash. <laughs> here we go. So who are we? So we started in 2013. Let me grab this. Started in 2017 or 13, and we're founded by a group of surf surfers in San Diego. So Nate Ferguson, Matt Lee, Rob Ferguson, and Ron Gershoni. OK? Uh, we were about 100,000 in revenue that first year. Since then, we've roughly doubled more, more or less every year. Uh, we're a distillates and concentrate company, and one of our trademarks is up there. You can see the top it's water clear pen. The trademark is actually the uh, cedar, uh, the, the sandalwood tip. So sandalwood is very uh, uh, renewable in terms of a tip. Most places have metal or plastic. So that's one of our signature jetty things. The next thing is the dablicator. The dablicator is a way of dabbing that you can uh, allows you to control a little bit more than sticking a scoop into you know a little jar and uh, then just dabbing that so you can, it's got a little clicking mechanism and you can more or less get a decent dose it's a little uh, cleaner so really great product okay uh, the last thing I want to talk about Jetty who are we uh, the shelter project so the shelter project is a compassionate care program started in 2014 by our own Lindsay Friedman and uh, at one point, we had 1,000 patients that we were giving um, formulated or unformulated cannabis medicine to for free. We gave over a, over a million dollars in free uh, 
but I didn't say merchandise, free product. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, SB 64 decided that they would impose a tax on donated goods. And this really affected compassionate care. Probably some of you out there actually know about this. So uh, Lindsay's first efforts and everybody's first efforts actually failed on, gov on uh, Jerry Brown's desk. He vetoed the first compassionate care bill. And now we've got uh, SB 34 in the works. So call your congressman, congressperson, and tell them you support SB 34, because that's going to make things more rational. We're not going to be able to have to pay taxes. It's going to be a lot more easy to enroll people in the program. So I don't know if anybody's a fan of Jetty, but did you know we used to make edibles? And uh, they were from 2016, 2017, called uh, excuse me, Jetty Mind Tricks, OK? And that's cannabis-infused toffee. And I have no idea to this day how they got the name. Perhaps uh, Obi-Wan here could tell you these are not the droids you're looking for. Jedi Mind Tricks, OK? I actually do know. So what am I going to talk about today? Cannabis, dis cannabis distillate production is basically what we do. And this is sort of a summary. Uh, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Probably absolutely everybody in the room knows everything about this topic. But nonetheless, here we go. So we, first step is biomass preparation. Then we have extraction, winterization, filtration, then concentration. Decarboxylation, which a lot of people just call decarb, but it's also a devolatilization process. We have final distillation of the cannabinoids. And then, as a side note, we have actually cannabis essential oil production. And this isn't really necessary to the distillate market because there exist uh, all sorts of flavor elements that are out there, including fake uh, plant-derived terpene profiles, which will have the name of a chemo cannabis chemovar. You all probably know about that. So here are a few examples of my work. Uh, on the top left there is God Only Knows. I believe it's Reclaim. Not super proud of that color. Uh, the next is our D8 Reserve, Delta 8. Pretty high ratio there. And then the last is the Water Clear Delta line in the corner there. So who were we before I came to Jetty? We were Prop 215 compliant. OK. We're using uh, CO2, supercritical fluid extraction, and ethanol extraction capabilities at that time. Uh, for the winterization slash precipitation, we had a cold room. We had to do carbon scrubbing. Uh, we did vacuum filtration with large fritted funnels. I'm sure you've all seen these. Buchner funnels, that kind of thing. A little bit of iteration. We had one small rotovap at first for the CO2. We just needed to do a light uh, winterization. And, you know, um, you've heard the story about a thousand monkeys with a thousand typewriters. And, you know, they can write the uh, perfect novel. Well, early in the early days of cannabis, you know, what I've seen and been told is basically if you had a machine and it was working, you just bought five more of them, you know, and that, that would do it. So um, we started with that. Then we were doing a manual decarboxylation. We weren't devolatilizing at that point. And we had a two-inch pope, so a white film system. Uh, we had to do two passes, so one to remove the quote-unquote terp fraction. Talk about that a little more later. And we had done some research on short path distillation, but never used it for production. And initially, short path was how I learned to do what all of you pretty much knew how to do before I was, you know, cannabis was a uh, twinkle in my eye or whatever, how you put it. And so I had an old legacy short path, a two liter and a five liter, okay? Uh, we were doing small scale production of cannabis essential oils. As soon as I arrived at Jetty, we were doing cannabis essential oils. Just want to make that clear. Because when I walked in, I didn't have these uh, plant derived profiles to smell. As an example of what cannabis tasted like in a vape pen, I had the real McCoy. And so when, after I tried that, you know, you know, it was revealed to me there were plant profiles and so on. And I tried that and I was like, oh, yuck. Oh, yuck, this won't do. But I don't want to knock it. Some people like it. But uh, in the early days of our cannabis essential oil production, we had small, uh, similar off flavors in every batch, OK? So we were using a technique that I'll get into in a second. But there was a problem in Denmark there. And one of the things about Jetty that, that I'm going to emphasize in this talk is we don't stand still. We always critique what we're doing. We always try to be better. We don't look at the competition. We look at what we are doing, 
okay? Because these guys who founded Jetty, they love the plant. I love the way the plant smells. I love vaping, okay? I love this company. And so we put so much love in our products that we actually talk about this. We'll actually sit and talk about intentionality. And this is, you know, something my, before I met my lovely wife that I'd really never heard about intentionality. It was my intention to get to my molecule the quickest that I could. So when, you know, this whole concept of intentionality, it sort of brought me to this community and this whole idea of plant-based medicine. So enough asides, I will do a lot of them. Let's move on to the next slide here. So where are we now? We're Prop 64 compliant. Hydrocarbon is our main method of extraction with de-waxing capabilities. Uh, we have precision grinding. Uh, instead of just the cold room, we also have a minus 60 cryo freezer. We're no longer doing any scrubbing. We have large capacity stainless steel filtration. We only need large rotovaps. Uh, we have a VTA, which is a very nice continuous wipe film system. You can do in two passes, just like the Pope at a lot higher capacity. We, uh, in uh, February, we acquired an HP1, HP2 hot condensing short path and uh, distillation device, and it's amazing, people. I don't know if anyone's used this or seen this on at Breaking Dab's website, but it's a game changer. And now, thank God, it's my R&D piece, and I got to retire the old five-liter summit bastard. Um, you know, we'll talk about how fast that one was, but you know what? It's, you know, you always gotta love your, you know, the first thing you trained on, but this thing's a Cadillac now. And, um, you know, with, with work, we, just, we devised scalable production of cannabis essential oils, and we eliminated the off flavors, okay? So you may see me stop and take a sniff of these if I'm feeling like a little woozy, something like that. This is a gelato from Grizzly Peaks. That's the farm that made the material. And I have a pen. I can, you know, later we can talk about it. But... This is just greater in aromatherapy in itself. One of the things I love about my job is I get to walk into a place where I have a fridge full of cannabis-derived terpenes. So no matter my mood, there's something for it. Okay, so we just started talking about Prop 64. There's one thing we gotta really talk about in Prop 64. Which is probably my biggest contribution to Jetty, I would say, in the machines department, okay? And that is analytical testing, okay? There's two types of analytical testing that I've broadly categorized in the cannabis industry, and one's accuracy, so cannabinoid potency, and also terpene testing. If you want to put terpenes on your label in California, you got to have them tested, you all know this, within, I believe it's 10% of the printed value on your package or you fail compliance. And that's, as you all know, a very bad thing. Safety as well. So I have on the right the, uh, it's not the 62, it's the 58 pesticides that can be tested by HPLC. There's 62. And of these, there's uh, category two, and uh, category one. Does anybody know the difference between category one and category two? I do. If you even see category one on your uh, data, you're done. Fails compliance. Mainly this is because these pesticides that have been used in the cannabis industry before are not designated as safe pesticides by the state of California to be used on, in food production. So that's where that came from. So below is a little nice 97.13% uh, total cannabinoids. That's one of our uh, nice oils there. So that's an idea of sort of the potency testing. So along with safety, we have residual solvents, okay? And so back in the day, and I'll talk about this, there was sort of a different category for residuals, but now they compromise solvents that are deleterious to human, uh, or, I don't know if that's the right word, are bad <laughs> for uh, humans to inhale, okay, or eat. Uh, we also have mycotoxins, so these are toxins produced by microorganisms that uh, are dangerous to human health. We really don't have a problem with these in distillate. And then, of course, heavy metals, CAT3, you have on the next slide, we've got arsenic, ACLM, ACL me. That's a little MRI thing, the ACL, people tear it. So arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury, okay? We've got to keep those to parts per billion levels. 
So what do I talk about this about Jetty? Well, we're ahead of the curve. Even before I got there, before they were even asked to do this, Jetty was doing potency and pesticide testing. And the records go all the way back. They're kind of fun to look at. Steep Hill was the only game in town. That's what we used. Uh, in July 2016, started with CW. Did terpene testing and also residual solvents. And here's the thing about residual solvents. It was less than 5,000 parts per million of flammable solvents. Okay, flammable solvents. Which is funny because ethanol is really flammable too. And although it's not great to inhale, it's not going to kill you or give you cancer like chloroform, dichloroethane, you know, dichloroethane, some of these really gnarly chlorinated solvents. So, you know, by the grace of uh, the chemists who worked with the BCC and whatnot, we got a new list of uh, residual solvents include the chlorinated solvents and also benzene, xylenes, things like that, although those are flammable. So let's talk about the heavy metals because I don't think the industry was ready for this. Are you guys ready for CAT3? Right? CAT3 hit, it hit everybody like a kick in the pants. The reason is, is the equipment that the labs needed to study CAT3 is inductive coupled plasma, okay? It's an expensive technology. It's very accurate. Uh, the old technology, atomic absorption, wasn't quantitative enough. So who even had an ICP? Who even had the working capital to spend 150 grand, 200 grand, and figure it out, and have a chemist figure it out how to do it, okay? These guys, as you know, these guys and gals in the testing labs, they're backed up, you know, a week sometimes. So you've got to pull somebody off to uh, get that ICP running. Okay, so when I came to Jetty, we have all these things that, that are mandated and we've got to figure out what is going to be our response. Let's get to that. Okay, so the two pictures on the right, the top one that looks like something out of Star Wars is a triple quad HPLC mass spec, mass spec, and it's used for those 58 pesticides. The other four I didn't mention, you need a gas chromatograph. On the bottom there is the HPLC UV viz that I would have been able to afford. So, you know, you just dial it in, it pumps, it's great. Um, so, in-house analytics. So that was the first thing I was asked to evaluate, and we went around and we looked at stuff, and the HPLC UV viz was the standard for potency, okay, it still is. And we were, you know, interested in that, but it was about 40 or 50 grand to get in that, and don't know if you know this, HPLC is a liquid chromatography technique, so now we've got to have organic solvents and we've got to have a place to deal with organic solvents. We didn't have fume hoods at the time, so we decided against that one. Next option, triple quad and a GCMS. Like I said, there's four pesticides you can't do with the triple quad. So that was about 300K used. Plus, as you heard earlier, I'm not an analytical chemist. I'm an organic chemist. I'm a jack of all trades. That's my uh, Instagram name. So, you know, I told the guys, you know, if we're going to go for this, you know, HPLC triple quad, I'm going to need some training. You know, I'm going to need some training, and it's going to be a lot of my time on this thing, and I want a service plan, et cetera, et cetera. So the numbers started rising, and we just kind of decided, you know, that's not really what we need to do for just one category. So in there at the bottom, I'll mention it was the ICP. I kind of put that there as a joke because um, it really can't do anything else for us but heavy metals. So the middle thing is what we settled on, the GCFID, because it can do pot uh, potency of the neutral cannabinoids, uh, THC, and then to do THCA and all the other acid cannabinoids, you have to do something called derivatization, but I believe there still is to this day a testing lab in California that uses GC uh, to do uh, its pesticide testing. Okay, GCMS. You can take a GCFID, it's flame ionization detector. Vaporized particles hit, or hit they hit a flame and they're counted by uh, basically a detector, counts uh, ionized particles. We're really good at uh, measuring small electrical signals. And uh, so that's how that works, forms a peak every time a substance comes out of the machine. You can, um, I can go into this a little bit more at the end if people really want to go into these techniques. But we could add residual solvents and we could add terpene profiles. 
just by slapping something on the end of the machine. It was only about ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and I would probably have begged for a service plan, but you know, it's better than the uh, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so the best return on investment. Remember what I said, Jetty? We're all about running lean. We're all about intentionality. And so um, I would have loved to have all those instruments. Absolutely love to have my own lab like that and have Jetty pay for it. Um, <laughs> we scientists, we love to have toys, y'all, and we love to have y'all pay for it. <laughs> so um, what we decided on was a GC flame ionization detector. So we got a quick potency method for oil from ResTech, and in four minutes, four minutes, I had my answer. And in fact, in two and a half minutes, I had my answer, because pretty much all the cannabinoids that wanted, you know, would, would elute um, were done after two and a half minutes. I don't know if anybody knows about thin layer chromatography, the old school method. You have these little plates. We use them to monitor reactions and purity. Well, they take about, you know, two and a half minutes to run. GC, I can actually get percentages and ratios, and man, I'm telling you, you know, I, I almost never ran TLC again, but uh, GC went down for a little bit, so we had to do that. But anyway, so I really liked it because now we, could, we had a, a machine that could do really quickly uh, potency testing. We could monitor our distillations. We could monitor incoming material. Um, you know, just sort of things that everybody has to know. Like how, like, it was just insane to me that people were producing distillates with all these procedures and didn't have their own analytics. It was just like, what? Yeah, man, looks good, brah. Looks, it's yellow, yeah, look at that. It's good, brah. Well, little did I know, I mean, you can actually do a lot with a visual inspection and chemists have been, for hundreds of years, have been doing that. But I come from a fancy little graduate school and we have all our machines that y'all paid for. So. Useful reactions uh, involving basic cannabinoids. So everybody now is on to these, these minor cannabinoids, right? THCV, CBN, right? D, D8, uh, THC acetate, THC hemisuccinate, hexahydro THC. Well, guess what? If I want to go into the lab and make these things, I can actually watch my reactions proceed and decide that if I have my head up my butt or I actually found something really, really quickly. So we wanted that capability. And we were also be able to do terpene profiles. Uh, it's easy to operate, no solvent. And then of course the upgrade that I talked about. Okay. So GC succeeds where HPLC fails. All right, this is an interesting story that I wanna kinda tie in a little bit later. We're gonna come back to it at the end. I probably want to bite into QC a little bit to talk about this, but you know, we're, we're here to talk about production and innovations, and this is a little bit of science, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and skip past that, skip past the data, and we're gonna talk about, go back into my outline. Biomass is the first step. So we found biomass preparation necessary for CO2. Everybody knows that you can't just takes you know, a, a, a mallet and start jamming this CO2 thing full of, uh, full of uh, uh, biomass. It's not efficient. And uh, if anyone knows who Marcus Rogan is, um, at the time I met him, he was uh, at Outco. He actually optimized particle size and a number of other uh, con uh, concerns with CO2 and his CO2 oil. It looked amazing. So anyway, back to when I, uh, uh, back off my tangent, we used Ninja Blenders. Actually, you know, I would say Nate did. They went up, they told me they'd go up to Humboldt County with a bunch of Ninja Blenders, and they would hack that crap out. And everybody's going, what, Blenders? Are you, you know, and they, you know what the really funny thing, and this is what dials back to Marcus Rogan, is guess what grind is best for cannabis, terpenes, and CO2? The frickin' Ninja Blender. The Ninja Blender. That's a tidbit from Marcus's talk. Okay, when we moved to ethanol, we found that, that grinding was unnecessary. This was the early days, and we were getting a lot of chlorophyll from our biomass, okay? So uh, we really needed no advancement in grinding technology. CO2, or the, uh, when we got into hydrocarbons, we had to ditch that ninja. Neo Farms told us, ditch that ninja. We've got you, bro. It's, uh, it's, it does this stuff really fast, you know? 
and it beats the Ninja Blender, and it kind of looks like, it looks like a snow-making machine to me. And much like a snow-making machine, it loved to blow Keef all over the room, okay? Many of you have probably used this one. So we had no dust control, and I would not go near that room when that thing was running. Just allergies like crazy. So we had no control of particle size, we had no speed control, and there was, like I said, a heck of a loss in mechanical material. So at that same conference where I met Marcus Rogan, he introduced me to a company called, uh, I believe it's called Fritch, okay, that make these Cadillac hammer mill uh, uh, grinders, okay? So it's not like it's amazingly new tech, it's just kind of new to cannabis. But those things, being a Cadillac, are a lot of money. So we did our usual Jetty research, and we, we kind of got in, you know, in the room, and Spock was asked what he thought about the grinding, and I mentioned that I'd seen this hammer mill tech. And then our pro, uh, lab manager, Kurt, went out, and he just, he just scoured the earth for a, an affordable solution. So that's how we got it to the, uh, uh, the uh, hammer mill technology. And let's get to the picture of this. So this is our key room and this is our fancy grinder. Now we have positional blades. We have air assist if we need it because Keith gets sticky. We got sieve screens. Uh, we can control particle size and boy howdy. Look at those numbers. 45 minutes before to process, not precision process, 50 pounds. Get that hammer mill running, 10 pounds in 50 minutes. Or, or I mean 50 pounds in 10 minutes. See, I get a lot of stuff backwards. Okay, so this really, really kicked it up a notch. Extraction, okay, this is kind of the big thing that I really don't feel like I need to talk to about a ton because everybody is super passionate about the way they do things. But, you know, at Jetty, we do a lot of stuff by trial and error, small scale, and at the time, there were just some disadvantages to these, uh, these, these other techniques that we had. Um, the, main, the main message here is throughput and regulation. CO2 couldn't do the throughput we needed. And ethanol, while it was good, if we wanted to scale it up, which we did, we were growing, uh, we had to change our uh, chemical manufacturing status because we needed more than 1,000 gallons in process. So what we had was we had one of these little waters guys. That's actually a pretty big waters guy. We had, we had a single tube. And then we got the Delta CUP, and that's what we used. And when you, you know, they helped. We were, we were cranking out oil. Um, one last thing I'd like to say about the ethanol issue is filtration and bottlenecks. Everybody knows solvent recovery is crazy. And also, if you, I don't know about the cryo technique, but when we were doing it, the particle size, this stuff would coagulate like crazy, these fats and waxes. And so we had to, uh, you know, we, it was a bottleneck. I mean, you'd be scraping it. We tried all kinds of different iterations. So it was nice when we finally got to hydrocarbon and we were able to uh, see a much more easy to deal with process. So the decision to do hydrocarbon summer 2017 to 2019 was a decision driven by regulation. Uh, we got our type seven license and so we're ready to go. And before we went a little crazy, we got ourselves a little bit busy bee and I'm not sure we even owned it. And we just started doing what we do. We started doing experiments and, and it's like I said, it's what we found that the processing, post-processing went to almost nothing. You know, there's all kinds of post-processing that everybody knows about here, and I'm not going to belabor the point. It's all on Future 4200, and that's where I learned it all. But for us, speed, okay? The more you can do with the less labor is more efficient. You're faster to market, and, you know, that's really important to us. We're growing. So we decided that we would go with hydrocarbon deliberately, okay? When I first got into this, I was like, well, hydrocarbon's really bad. And then I was introduced to the process and I realized the only thing left in these extracts is ethanol from winterization. And anybody who winterizes or uses ethanol is going to potentially have ethanol in their final material. So that faded. So we got Betsy up there in the corner. I don't know who named her, but uh, she's a workhorse. And we did this because at the time ethanol distillate could only do, or ethanol could only do distillate. 
And we wanted to branch out. We, you know, these guys, these guys have been doing this since 2013. Nano and Dispensary, we knew about the variety of products that were out there. The diamond technology was just starting to come on. Um, these cookies, has anyone ever seen cookies? These little cookie things? Okay, we brought on a guy named Tran, and he is a butane artiste. He loves making pictures and stuff with butane. So um, don't do like I did and assume they're Nilla wafers in the break room. Don't do it. Thank God the metabolism of THCA, right, is very, very slow in your body, and it's not decarbed yet, or I would not be here talking to you. They're not Nilla wafers, but they are delicious, and we'll be releasing them fairly soon. The last picture over here is our C1D1 room shot from above. The C1D1 room, and I guess I should talk about this a little bit with Jetty. We literally doubled in size when we were getting our hydrocarbon and our intake uh, apparatus ready because we knew hydrocarbon was going to kick ass and, and do a lot of trim. So we acquired, there was a whole other company here when I started. We acquired that side and we were able to expand. So we actually have two C1D1 rooms, and one of them we use for pesticides and filtration. So quickly, let's talk about winterization. Not going to belabor the point. Used to use a walk-in freezer. Got this sweet-ass cryo freezer, minus 60. 48 hours goes down to four hours. And uh, with the, the hydrocarbon precipitates the fats and waxes, uh, it's a lot easier to deal with. OK, so here's, like I said, the, the 1,000 monkeys with 1,000 typewriters mentality. So these 15 mil Buchner funnels, they're really great. And uh, you can you know, take that amount of uh, activated carbon, which we needed, and you needed about 500. But it looked like an organ, so it was pretty awesome. And if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. Uh, we had much larger ones, 2,000. Now here is what we ended up buying, this stainless steel uh, filter skid table or stainless steel, stainless steel filter table with basically on a skid. And eventually the idea is, you know, as everyone's done and Heisenberg's done, you basically, you want to go to manufacturing that simply never sees any buckets or anything. It's all in line, okay? So this piece of equipment will eventually be able to integrate into this type of thing. So the great thing about this is we went from 40 kilograms a day or, uh, I'm sorry, six kilograms a day with that nasty, goopy stuff to 45 kilograms a day, and we're still under capacity. Like, if anybody needs to filter in the Bay Area, I'm sure we can toll process, Nate. That <laughs> we'll, we'll, toll, we'll toll process your filtration. So we did this with half the labor. Um, if anybody wants to know, uh, it's an infinity manufacturing concept, okay? Concentration, okay, I'm accused of not having a lot of concentration sometimes. But concentration, simply solvent removal, and you've got our first little guy up there in the top, a Buki Rotovap, two liter, and then you've got the 20 liters, and then the Rotovaps are retired, okay? There are R&D Rotovaps now, um, you know, put colored liquids in them, whatever. But anyway, so we started out with the, the 2015 with the two liter, and then 2016 when we moved to ethanol, as you guys, as you all know, uh, the uh, capacity that you need to do solvent removal is just crazy. So 2017 to 2019, when we moved to hydrocarbons, uh, we were able to drop back to 220 liters, but we also needed five two liter rotovaps that we already had to do the final processing to get it ready for the decarb, okay? And so that whole, that workflow was based on the decarb workflow. Okay, April 2019 is when we initiated the new decarb, which is what I'll talk about next. And we retired the little road of apps, okay? And um, we're doing an average of four liters per hour of solvent removal, okay? I, I know if I'm looking at the time, I, I tend to ramble, so let's try to pick it up. 2016, 2019 were the dank ages. Uh, we're talking about atmospheric decarb. This is a picture of how VTA told us how to decarb. They said, put it on a hot plate and stir it for eight hours. Okay? <laughs> and that's fine, though. It works. It actually works really well. Okay? But it just kind of gives off a lot of volatiles, a lot of dank. But it does work really well. And um, we wanted to do it a little bit more efficiently. 
Because the reason it's on there for eight hours, and we knew this, is when you're doing manual decarb, it only took about an hour for the bubbles to stop. Well, why the heck are we doing this for eight hours? Well, it's those volatiles. And just let me kind of divide up uh, cannabis, if I, if I, you know, I will, just in some broad categories. So for distillation. So we have, basically, we're going to have an insoluble amount of stuff that we're going to remove in winterization, or we're not going to extract. Then we have the first set of volatiles, cannabis-derived terpene, essential oils. The next, the next half are what I call the volatiles, and those are uh, all the way up to the, the boiling point of the cannabinoids, what we really want. And then afterwards, you have what everyone calls, I think, calls retente. It's the goop. Okay? So we have to get rid of that, those, uh, uh, those um, volatiles above the cannabis-derived essential oils. A lot of them. We did do, quote unquote, terp runs, so some of the higher volatiles right before the distillation point of the cannabinoids, okay, we could, we could strip those out. But the lower volatiles would really mess up the white film. So uh, we had to get rid of them. But, you know, being a chemist and having been cut my teeth on short path distillation, I decided that we could do this under vacuo. And I know people were doing this way before we were, but as Jetty goes, I had to prove concept. I can't just walk in and be like, hey, all, this is illogical. This is just illogical. No, I had to show them it worked. I had to show them it worked. Took me about on and off, three or four months, messing around with systems. And then I finally got a system that retired our road of apps and made a 24-hour process into eight hours. And unfortunately, the delicious tangy smell was gone. OK. So distillation, this is one of the large, largest capital investments. OK. Boy, I didn't even get to the dank ages. So this is what I was talking about. Uh, OK, so distillation, uh, the largest capital investment, decision time. We decided to go with white film instead of short path because basically it was just easier. Short path takes skill. And I learned no more. Uh, the most I ever learned about the skill it took was from this man uh, breaking dabs over there because I really thought I had gotten short path. You know, I'd made this beautiful water clear oil and, and you know, I thought, man, I got this down. You know, I can do one liter in seven hours. This is cooking. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, so we decided to go with the Pope. It uh, produces actually a pretty nice oil. You can do two passes, or you have to do two passes. And the picture over there is, our, is an example of a, a that's a, probably a six inch Pope actually. But you know, the distillate comes out on one side, the retente on the other, and uh, you do your two passes or it's terps. And so then we decided to add another Pope. And we added the four inch Pope. And although we were able to load more, and this is kind of a funny contradiction, there was no change in speed, okay? We didn't have con a continuous white film distillation system. And so we had to have operators load it, unload it. So we went to one of the uh, you know, really famous uh, consulting firms to get an auto feeder. Well, in those days, I want to say the tech wasn't ideal. And unfortunately, the dream of running the thing overnight and continuous extraction failed. So that's when we started looking at these continuous extraction uh, white film. And I just want to say that I guessed wrong. I, I, I just got to put this out there. I, I bet on the wrong pony. And they overrided me, and I'm glad they did. So we decided to go with the VTA instead of an American brand that I really loved, and I've heard a lot of bad things about since then. But anyway, this is a really passionate Topic, so I'm not going to go into it. Uh, we got root sciences, German engineering, and we can do VKL with our VKL. What is that? 705RS. Okay, that's our model. We can do eight liters a day. We could probably push this and break it. And that's with two passes. So we have a better color distillate, and we're consistently, I put in the 90s, but you know what? It honestly depends on the biomass, too, that we're getting. And uh, at least always, you know, in the, in the middle high 80s. And so this is a beautiful jar of the oil there. And this is our, um, I don't even know what it is, lab manager, Jones. And that's our beautiful uh, root science right there. So it's amazing. You load the material here and all under vacuum through the wiper. 
and then the oil just comes out here. So it's pretty cool technology, and I know there's a lot better stuff, but right now at Jetty, it's working for us, and we will make the investment in the next step of technology when we go to that continuous flow through uh, process that I was talking about. And so right now, you know, we're kind of looking at that and how we're going to do it. Um, so I've been sneaking a recorder and a camera into Heisenberg Manufacturing and, you know, just click, 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 click. Oh, this is great. How do you do this? Click, 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 click. Okay. So um, let's see where I'm at in this talk. Travis, I got a time check, 10 minutes. Can I do? I'm sorry. So um, I really wanted to talk about this a lot because this is, this is one of my favorite things to do. This is my research um, instrument. And this is, was the biggest breakthrough in short path as far as I'm concerned. It was called wide bore and hot condensation. And uh, he developed it in 2016. I really can't go through this slide as, as much as I'd like, but it's gonna, you're gonna have it available to you. Uh, long story short, we bought one. And there's me with the system. And that allowed us access to D9, water clear, D8, THCV, and now I'm doing two liters in five hours, okay? And that's start to finish with decarb in the pot. I can do a second pass in uh, two to three hours. So this thing rocks. So that takes down the resident time, which is really important. Okay, so really quickly, let's talk about cannabis-derived terpenes. So this is my thing. And uh, I want you to call them CEOs, cannabis essential oils, because they're more than just terpenes. There's hundreds of terpenoid and non-terpene compounds uh, available in the volatile portion of um, this plant. And one of them is nonanal. It's not non-anal. Get your heads out of the gutter. And it's, it's uh, got a floral and orangey smell, and it is n in no way a terpene. It's an aldehyde, C9 unit, okay? But actually, it's one of the highest contributors to the odor of cannabis if you take cannabis and put it in a duffel bag for 68 hours. Uh, known and Al, and you sample the headspace around it, Known and Al is actually one of the strongest scents. And we were training the dogs to do uh, caryophylline oxide. Okay, so where were we at Jetty? We were doing steam still. Steam still is what everybody's doing, doing the R&D, then we bought a big one, looks like this. Water goes in here, biomass in there, heat the steam, comes on out. The steam uh, cools and then is caught in here. The terpenes will float on top, the cannabis oils float on top, and then you can separate them, okay? So we're doing 100 pounds a day, pretty good. Let's see here. Okay, I wanna show you really quickly the difference between a, a profile and a cannabis-derived essential oil. It's in the grass, is what I said. So this is a, a profile of uh, Granddaddy Perp, and probably see about 20 peaks, maybe. This is a cannabis essential oil of an OG Kush. And my GC isn't even that great. It's not even that great. And look at alpha pinene. This is, this is on my method. So I can only sample boiling points around here. I get a headspace, I can go more. Alpha pinene, there's compounds in front of it. Okay, and we know roughly what these compounds are. We know that there's about 400 of them. So if somebody wants to finance me to start getting some standards, then I would appreciate it and we'll start figuring out exactly what this is or we'll farm it out. Okay, so the next iteration, now that you know what cannabis essential oils are and how complicated they are, is to do it under with a vacuum assist so you can do it at a lower temperature. Well, this was betterish. Um, when I smelled ste steam still oil, it was it really all smelled the same to me. And it had a ca burnt caramel and a grassy smell. And then we got to atmospheric and the smells were still there and I so hated them that, that I would just be super picky about it and be like, this is, this is not acceptable, this is, this, no. And um, by the way, I studied in France so I'm not trying to insult uh, the French people, I love them. Um, so it also took days to dry. Okay, that was the big thing. We had to have a drying room. Weed turns brown, it's gnarly. Uh, you can't go in there without a mask. You know, it's, it takes too long. Uh, and we still have those off flavors. So I just went in the lab, and like I said, we always try to do better and better and better. And through Mark 1, through Mark 4, I finally was able to prove to Jetty, we love the essential oils that we're, we were making, but we're only making them on small scale. So I was able to prove to Jetty that we could do this. 
Finally, we got to the Mark IV. The, the, real, the real kicker for us was when we did a water clear Skywalker OG pen, and Noah and Travis tasted this, among others, and they were like, whoa, whoa. Yeah, and we were like, whoa, whoa. And what I said about accidental medicine is we actually gave these pens to, you know, all over the convention. And I had a, a, a patient or a person write me back and said, this is the best D8 water clear I have ever had for pain. And I wrote him back and I said, it's not D8, it's D9. And he was like, well, I don't know why. I've tried every D9 product I can get my hands on. And so we were like, crap, must be the Terps. We're not sure, but it's something we'd like to study. Anyway, so it's been implemented at Jetty. We're making cannabis-derived terpenes at scale, and we can get broad profiles. We can, we can control the profile if we want. The drying room is gone, and the Mark V is in development and probably is going to be up that high. Okay? So it's happening. This is, this is the year of cannabis essential oils, this year and next, oil, next year, folks. That's my prediction. Other methods, you can look at these. Um, we looked at them, didn't like them microwave, and then what I call Pangea tech. Um, just go ahead and go through that. That's from biomass. Yeah, Pangea was a IC mag, so woot woot open sourcing, okay? IC, IC mag, he uh, or she, I, don't really, I never even really met Pangea, designed a uh, system. You can go on and you can Google it. And uh, it actually makes really nice water clear, good smelling kind of essential oils. Okay, now here's the meat and potatoes. Of the actual events, we have a timeline from 2018 to May 2019, and here shows what happened with the implementation of these uh, technologies. So when we got to hydrocarbon, we, we increased our production 50 to 100%, and our capacity increased 100%. The VTA, the cryo freezer, we got in August 818, got about the same time, and I'd like you to understand the numbers are kind of melded together. But uh, when you go from 48 hours to four days, that helps. Uh, the VTA, 470% increase in production, capacity up 800%. Filter table, 13% increase in production in, in uh, January 19. And uh, then we, uh, excuse me, the capacity increased uh, 750% in half the labor. Uh, category three screwed us over. I think it screwed everyone over. Uh, output dropped. Uh, our input, in, so production dropped, and that meant input also dropped. Okay, uh, significant events as well. The Mark IV came online, and we, are, we were able to access these essential oils in our products. Um, I don't know if anyone's noticed a difference. I hope you have. In 319, we, uh, in, we instituted the SPD tech. We were able to do Jetty Reserve. Okay, it actually has a 4% in increase in production of these specialty products. And if we max this thing out, we could get 12. Decarb devolatilization, another 12 percenter. And the thing about that is 24 process, our process goes to eight hours, and we no longer need this large decarb area. We no longer need the, uh, the road of apps. We've got a lot of space to expand, okay? This is great. Um, R&D space, I wish. So over this period, over this 15th month period, we had a tenfold increase in the amount of uh, material we were able to bring in. So the technology just fed exactly, you could, if, if I had the line here, I didn't want to put it, but it basically follows this trend exactly. And now we're kind of in a little bit of a period where things are kind of cuckoo. And we can talk about that later if you want. Um, in summary, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, just Jetty's ahead of, Ahead of the curve, usually. Um, we work together. We do things intentionally. And if you get anything about in my talk, it's something you already knew, that extraction and distillation methods determine capacity. Uh, we run lean. The largest acquisition that I made was a 35K short path. Everything else I did, the Terps, the decarb, everything else, that was done under uh, $10,000. The GC was done around 20K. OK. so. Our commitment to cannabis essential oil has upped our game. Uh, we have great capabilities to, uh, I mean, this is, this is just, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Just making them is the tip of the iceberg, folks. If you have the tech to make them, you can do so much. Okay, and that the last but not least, sort of my deal, is that manufacturers with their own analytical, even if it's just a GCFID, are more agile. 
Okay. Do I have time to talk to a little talk a little bit about the story about about the D10? Why this made us more agile? Yeah. Okay. So first, uh, let's go talk about that. Okay. So, does anybody here know what Delta 10 THC is? Okay, good, okay. This is Delta 10 THC, I've got, there's no chiral, chirality indicated here, so this is just a general structure. The double bond has moved from this position to this position. Different molecule, different shape, different activity. On the top there is a molecule called D6A, D10A, okay? It's another cousin of cannabis. So let's talk about this story here. So while I'm clicking back, while we were short pathing in these old five liters and two liters with long residency time, we were getting what we noticed, low potency oil. And we couldn't figure out why, because more passes is more better, the color got better. What's going on here? Well, we had a GC, you guys, so we could actually see what was going on. And what we were finding is that there are these two peaks. And that's about the sophistication I had with the GC. There are these two peaks. Because we didn't have standards for those compounds. We knew they fell in the cannabinoid range, so we weren't really super worried. But, you know, this was lowering our potency, and we couldn't have that. So here is a product that we had, uh, one of our orange and yeast products, with these two peaks. So I'll, if you can see, you've got CBD, and then there's question mark D10, D10A, 6A, THC. The reason that I, I can actually put those question marks there is because I thought it was an isomer of THC. I wasn't sure if it was D10 or any of the other things. I didn't know. Well, lucky for me, I met Noah Cook. And he gave me, he's like, here, here's some D10. What? Yeah, D10 might be your mystery peak. And uh, we took that sample back to the lab, and it was 80% pure, and thank God it was, because I got two peaks. If he just given me 100% pure delta 10, that would end this story, which gets a little more complicated. But so we had it, so we went and we took some material that had these peaks in it, and we spiked it, a little bit of D10. And lo and behold, we saw those peaks rise, no new peaks. We knew that we had delta 10, and it was lowering our potency. Well, these, these people went even further. They figured out the potency loss was due in part to high, uh, uh, high um, residency times and short paths, but also because there was FOS check out there. That crap they sprayed all over uh, California during the wildfires, and y'all probably got some cheap trim, right? So, but when you process this trim, you ended up getting uh, uh, an oil that had these breakdown peaks. This is what the oil should look like. So it wasn't in everything. Okay, so we had the GC and now I can monitor for this peak. I know now when I'm doing crap short path, okay? I know it's D10 and now I know that I can monitor all of our processes and see if D10 is happening and be like, hold the presses everyone. So that's how agile we are. So we, we don't have to take in bad material. There's tests for ammonium phosphate and ammonium sulfate, stuff like that. Now. Before, I want to end with this really quickly. So the D10 story gets a little more interesting. What about that second peak? Okay, everyone was talking about D10, 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 yada, yada, and I was like on Futures 4200, I was like, which diastereum or which enantiomer? And they were like, what? What are you talking about? Well, molecules have shapes. And even though they have the same exact chemical structure and bonds, there's something called handedness. Like, they're like mirror images, some of them, okay? And they don't have the same shape, they don't have the activity, and actually, uh, there are four potential compounds for D10. So, I thought, well, you know, these, that other peak is probably an enantiomer, or diastereomer, diastereomer, I would say enantiomer, diastereomers, because they have different boiling points. And here are two diastereomers at Meshulam et al, made in 1984, it's all out there. Sometimes we just don't know where to look for things because it's in the scientific literature, okay? So I did a little bit of an experiment. I read the literature and I found out that there's a difference in boiling point or melting point by 100 degrees on these things. And I'm like, well, guess what? Ha, it's not a diastereum or why? Because they would show up completely differently on the GC. So I've said, okay, we got one of these guys 
what's that next peak? Read the literature, and you see that if you heat them like crazy, they go to D6A, D10A. It was known in 1984, right? And I had this paper, and it was only until we got an NMR of this material that we had a little bit of a clue. And also, I want to share with you this experiment that actually clued me on as well. So I had some low potency short path oil and we have all this crap sitting around and I wanted to fix it. So I thought, hey, let's just throw some T41 clay in there. It's acidic. Let's turn it all into D8. Let's watch what happens, folks. Two hours into the reaction, delta-9 actually does start going down. You see a reduction in the D10 peak, and then this new peak starts rising up. And so I'm like, well, shoot, this sucks because that's actually where the other shoulder lines up to. So D8 and that are, God, they might be on top of each other. I don't know what's going on. Three hours, the reaction is pretty much finished. D9's almost gone. Uh, and then look at the D10 ratio almost completely gone, okay? So I was like, yeah, got it, bye. D10, you're out, I've got non, I've got a way to create delta eight. I've got delta eight, right, from junk. And people are interested in this. Well, <laughs> I sent it out for lab testing and unfortunately, and this ties into the other story why GC was better, I got uh, a result back that said it was D10 plus CBC. Well, as everybody knows, that peaks BS. The CB, there's no CBC in a lot of your low potency oils. It's Delta 10. But guess what, folks? It ain't just Delta 10. And that's me going out on a limb, okay? So what we learned, the result I got back, D10 plus, uh, you know, I thought I got rid of it, was 30%, okay? And if you go back and you look at, shoot. You go back and look at the starting material, the ratio of these suckers was about 30%. Okay? So nothing changed there, and I was really bummed. And I kind of set this aside, and then an NMR came up. And on the NMR, there was a small side product. This, this, this was very pure stuff. It was Noah's stuff. And on the NMR, there are these two little peaks out in a region where us chemists really know what's going on. And easy to see from everything else. And actually, what it turns out is there are these peaks right here. So they match up perfectly with delta 6A, delta 10A, okay? Guess what? I haven't proved shit, okay? I haven't proved anything. I've got, a, I've got a hypothesis. What do I need to do? I need a pure standard of delta 10A. I need an NMR of this. I need a GC of this. And what a fine mess we've walked into, folks, because all these potency labs, they've got HPLC UV Viz as their, uh, their method to do potency on your stuff. Guess what? D6A and D10A may be sitting under the same peak in their method. So they can't tell you the difference. So they can now say, oh, well, it's D10A, D6A, 10A, and 10. Yada, yada, and, and diastereomers. And actually, when this product is formed, it's actually not just one compound, it's two. It's the right hand and the left hand of D6A, 10A. It's racemic. So, boy, we've got cannabinoid soup. So, <laughs> I really hope that they can figure out a way to redo their method so they can see this stuff and top, stop telling everyone it's CBC. And if not, well, I've got a GC method to sell them. I mean, Restec does. Sorry about that. Okay. So, let's, let's finish off with acknowledgments. I'm just going to brush over this really quick. Thank you all for your patience. God, I talk forever. Um, so basically, uh, here's who made it all possible. And if these guys, Nate, Rob, Braun, and Matt hadn't been here, I wouldn't be up here. I put Kurt Dietenhofer up there because, like I said, I'm Spock. Well, Kurt is oftentimes Scotty and Chekhov and Uhura and everything else including the captain sometimes, and he just does amazing things. So I, made my, I make my scientific recommendation, we look into stuff, and then as a team we decide what we implement. Okay, so just here's the production team, um, Lindsay, of course, uh, Shelter Project, and then over here is everybody else that I'd like to specifically mention, and just to tie into our last proposal, you guys, I wouldn't know anything about cannabis as quickly as I did without open sourcing. And I'm going to put this out there, and this is another reveal. I am going to put 
my new terpene technology, not Jetty's technology, open source as soon as I figure out how to scale. So y'all can play yeah, with yeah. it. I'm gonna put it out there. I literally cannot control enough biomass in my dreams to make the amount of cannabis-derived terpenes that people are gonna wanna use for medicine and recreation. So that's my promise to you guys. Um, here's my email. You can follow us at, on IG at Jetty Extracts. I'm uh, at Dr. Jack Hughes, and it's been a pleasure speaking to you guys, and I'm sorry I went over. Give it up for Dr. Wyatt Calloway.